Thank you, everyone. It's such a pleasure to be here tonight to talk to my very dear friend, Dr. Theodore L. Mm -hmm. This essay is a story of many things, but for me, it is the story of friendship. I met Theo in these hallowed halls for a night class in 2017 and learning Arabic language. We sat next to each other and had the friendship born of strangers in a strange classroom. We were both learning the language because our stories were a collision of love stories. I was following my husband to Cairo. Theo was following his girlfriend, now wife, to Beirut. And so we bonded over being language students. And then our friendship began because we realized we were both writers that we will be heading to the Middle East together to unspool our lives and open our brains to a new part of the world to write stories and watch and take notes and learn and read and hold on to the world the way that writers know how to do. So I had a friend in the Spartan following experience and a friend on the page. And then we visited each other. I went to Beirut to visit Theo. Theo came to Cairo to visit me. And then the pandemic happened, and it turned our friendship into something that was alive and blossoming into something elemental and a support system. As my husband and I were separated by international borders because of COVID for more than a year, and then Theo and his beautiful wife, Katie, survived the Beirut port explosion. That explosion is part of, but not the entire story that Theo tells in this extraordinary essay. And tonight, I want to talk about this essay not to revisit those harrowing minutes and hours and days and the aftermath, but to talk about it as a literary achievement because it is an extraordinary literary achievement. So it is with great pleasure that I introduce you tonight to the winner of this year's Caliber Prize, Dr. Theodore. Thank you, Peter, for that wonderful introduction. Um, uh, our friendship really was a lifeline, um, especially in the darkest moments. But um, uh, before all that, then, I had always wanted to, uh, to call someone my opposite number in Cairo. Um, <laughs> and little thinking that I would ever have one and, uh, or be in a situation where I could possibly have one. And uh, so now to be sitting opposite my opposite number in Cairo. Uh, talking about an essay about Beirut. It's quite a surreal experience. It is surreal. Now, Theo, this is your first attempt at the Calder Prize, Australia's richest essay prize, one of the premier essay prizes in the world. It's your first attempt at a personal essay. Um, account for yourself, you talented <laughs> bastard. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, I can explain what happened, but I don't know if I can account for it. So it's a hotel quarantine. It was a hotel quarantine. I had been um, keeping notes about Lebanon the whole time we were living there, which was a bit more than two years. So I was there for more than two years. Um, and in the wake of the explosion, I kept a diary um, of thoughts, uh, images, um, emotional experiences, events that happened in order to try and make sense of what on earth we're going through. And then when we came back to Australia at the very beginning of January of this year, we had two weeks in quarantine. And um, I thought, right, well, I'd better start trying to get some of this in order. Um, and it was, uh, being in quarantine was a strange experience because we were in a hotel room overlooking Hyde Park in Sydney with no balcony and no windows we could open. Um, and I had been to high school just down the street from where we were standing. So we had this feeling of being stuck in a goldfish bowl with, with who we were sitting outside with who we'd been, because we're both from Sydney originally, who we'd been sort of replaying outside, where we had just come from and all that recently was playing inside. And uh, it was it was this hothouse of focusing uh, for just a few days' work, really, on telling aspects of the story that we experience. experienced. Kind of colourless place, then. Uh, yeah, everything layered, over, everything the layered uh, over, over on top of itself. I think it takes a global pandemic for that kind of mm -hmm. thing to happen. Um, but I also have to acknowledge that um, 
there was a particular very dear writer friend who gave me a gigantic kick up the bum to get this done, and it was <laughs> huge. Oh, so, there is a particular deep pleasure in being able to say that to me, so. Yeah. <laughs> and this is perhaps the sweetest of those. I told Theo there is an essay in this, and then I sent him the link to the Color Prize and went, enter, you get. Yeah. And, <laughs> and he won the thing, which is magnificent. So uh, I feel very yeah. smug. Yes. Rightly so, because um, I wrote it. I, I took the incentive of having this deadline uh, as a as as a, a spur to, to get the thing written and finished and and done and pinned to a page. Um, in, a, in a bit to try and reconcile myself to some of the memories, some of the traumatic memories that you experience. And when I uh, and, and also the idea of submitting a piece for a competition uh, appealed to me because I thought, well, right, I'll send it off and shut the door, and that's it. I probably won't hear anything about this and I'll just let it be and I'll come back to this project in a year or two when I feel ready to. But that wasn't No, that wasn't it. <laughs> um, and well, it's now getting on for a bit more than a month ago that I got a phone call from Peter Rose, the ABR editor, saying that I won. How does it feel? Because <laughs> we're, going to, we're going to skirt this territory because you have covered it so beautifully and so rawly on this essay. But you have written an essay about an acute traumatic experience, mm. and now you've shared that traumatic experience with a readership. How does it feel to have that out? Well, it, it, it's a very complex set of feelings. Um, I have to say that I was overjoyed when Peter Rose called me to tell me I'm one of this. Um, I was in disbelief, I just melted. Um, but I was, I was just supremely happy. You couldn't get more of a contrast between those feelings and the feelings that my wife and I, and I'm quite sure tens of thousands of people in Beirut were feeling on the evening of the explosion, which were feelings of terror and fear. And um, there we were, shouldering aside rubble and, and breaking open cracked door frames and treading on broken glass to get down the stairwell into the street not knowing if we'd even survived the night, thinking we'd survived some sort of bombing or some sort of missile, and heaven knows what we're going to follow it. So from existential terror to overpowering joy, it was quite a, quite a journey, quite a So it's almost a year. So these are yeah. the bookends of this yes. extraordinary year. It'll be a year next week, a year next Wednesday. Now this. Yeah, it's extraordinary essay, but it's an essay you would have written, I think, regardless of its coda. And in this essay, this is the explosion is a coda. And I want to talk about that because it's a really a very conscious decision you made. Mm -hmm. Another author perhaps would have started the essay inside of the harrow, inside of the blast itself. But in this essay, that is the end point. That is in a sense, yeah, a coda to the essay. Why was it important for you to start the story elsewhere, and, and where does that story start for us? Okay. Yes, well, I will say the, the explosion is a coda, or kind of a climax, um, and it was almost the only deliberate structural planning decision I made when approaching the essay, uh, uh, for, for a couple of reasons. One is that I thought, well, the, the, the explosions dominated the headline anyway, and understandably so. But there's so much else about Lebanon that most people in the world who've never been there or have ever seen it, who don't know people from Lebanon, just don't know. Uh, there, are, there are many beautiful things about it, and they deserve a space in the story. But also, I, I wanted to approach the explosion, uh, almost put myself in a reader's shoes, and try to, um, try to go back through all our experiences and understand just how the explosion could possibly have happened. Um, and I wanted, in narrating the experience, I wanted uh, things to be revealed to the reader as they had been revealed to me, as they had happened to me. I felt that would be a much more, if you like, productive way of explaining uh, the situation. So where does the essay start? The essay starts in lockdown. It starts in lockdown in, uh, in my memory, it's about April of 2020. It starts with an eerie quiet. Uh, because um, with a very hard lockdown uh, of the kind that is now in force in Melbourne and Sydney, um, suddenly Lebanon fell quiet. And Lebanon is a very noisy city. 
Um, yes. Yeah. Well, uh, Cairo isn't. It's the loudest city in the world, isn't it? Eighty-five decibels that family, which is the sound of a small rock concert. <laughs> I remember one night I was trying to finish edits to an essay and the noise was so extraordinary I decided to kind of pass each of the different sounds and I realised there was a car accident, there was an ambulance, there was scaffolding being erected on one building, scaffold being de-erected on another building, there was a jackhammer on my roof, there was a jackhammer underneath me and there were children crying. And I was trying to work out which of those I could eliminate if I could in my head. But it's this extraordinary symphony of a place, and yeah. the answer was most cancer in the place. <laughs> <laughs> you have to surrender to the chaos that is that yeah. I love the fact though, that someone has taken all that and actually worked out that it is the loudest city in the world, and someone's got that job. <laughs> One of my favorite parts of the fact is that I had uh, voice activated software that I would use to dictate my notes from, from reading books. I'm a literary critic. That's my day job, and so I would take notes from the book and read it to the computer. And if I stepped away from the computer and forgot to turn it off, the noise from Cairo would dictate itself. <laughs> and so I would come back with these pages of a transcribed city. So the jackhammer would go, why, 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 why? <laughs> and then the car horn would go, no! <laughs> there would be someone knocking on the door and you'd get, hello? Oh, and, then, and so you get this incredible transcript that seems speaking to you. And they often have very existential questions. Why? Where? Who are you? <laughs> no. Yeah. There's, there's found art in this. There's found poetry. But the thing is that Beirut can't be far behind uh, Cairo in this respect, um, because of the, especially because of the traffic. Um, but the thing is that well, the essay starts, and I, I thought it would be a good place to start because it was, it was the thing that shocked me um, six months out from the explosion or so. It was when Beirut suddenly fell silent. Um, and all you could hear in this spring, in spring was bird song. You would never hear it about it. Yeah. And we were lucky to be living in, a, in, a, in an apartment that had, well, it had a small garden of its own um, uh, on the ground floor. Yeah out the back and out the front of the lane there was a, the garden of another house and so birds actually came in. Um, it was quite extraordinary. So, so your essay, which is a contemporary piece, begins yeah. in a moment of citywide contemplation. That's right. Um, because uh, it, I started to think, okay, what really changed for Beirut then, apart from the obvious things, about, apart from the need to prevent the spread of COVID? Well, the thing is that in Beirut, and in Lebanon, generally, everyone has to keep moving. Everyone has to go somewhere to earn their living, make their money um, somehow. Uh, and uh, cars and major status symbols in Lebanon. And uh, it also brings out the idea of the, the terrible economic inequalities that exist in Lebanon because um, people, a lot of people who have money like to flaunt it, and so they have the Maserati or the Ferrari. And Ferraris and Maseratis will be overtaking the sort of coughing, spluttering taxis that are held together with string, or the gigantic dump trucks. Um, and so the sudden absence of all of this um, was, a, was a, seemed to me a really pretty profound shock uh, to a country that's had more than its fair share of shocks. Um, and so I, start, I, I thought that would be a place to start reflecting on where we, all we've been through and where we've come from. And that's why didn't just stop the city and stop in a sense its engine, but it allowed you to see quite acutely some of the kind of rhythms and patterns of the city that you might not have seen. And right. there's a section you have in your essay that you might read for us that sort of pulls that out quite, okay. quite beautifully. Well, um, yes. Uh, we've been in Lebanon for, well, my wife had been there for about 18 months by that stage. I had been there for a year a year and a quarter or so. And in 2019, the previous year, in the first half of the year, the first half of 2019 was the last six months when Beirut was anything like me. Um, and that had been the six months in which I had started to get to know it. I had culture shock and I'd been thrown by all sorts of things. And I'd seen a lot that I knew I would get to like, but it was just it was so different. It took a long time to get used to. Then in the second half of 2019, there was 
true revolution in which millions of people took to the streets. And that's another, another topic to talk about. Um, but having got to know all know Beirut and what it was all like in normal life, suddenly with normal life vanishing, um, when you're in a strange place, it heightens your senses and you start to uh, you start to think about you think more acutely about what you're seeing and interpreting why it happens and why somebody might speak this way to another person, why two people from the, from different religious groups might not get on together. Then suddenly to have that all removed. Um, it gives you a, a, a strange uh, sense of perspective on you. Uh, now, the, the, the passage uh, you uh, oh. yes, um, is, uh, is set in this period of silence. Um, and it takes place outside Beirut. It takes place um, in the Kadisha Valley, which I'll describe. And before you read it, I'd mm -hmm. just like to i like to ask the audience to pay attention to what Theo does because I don't think we often pay attention to language on a sentence level as well as what it's politically achieving. And these are some of the most beautiful paragraphs I think I've ever read in my life. Thank you Many Beirutis retreated to their ancestral mountain villages where it was cooler. This is in mid summer, it's very hot in there. We seized the chance to spend some days in the north around the Kadisha Valley, a gorge that eats into a ring of mountains. The peace there was immense. Pink and red roses thronged in garden beds. Cracks in the canyon wall overflowed with creepers. In the cupped palm of the mountains, high above the canyon, were the cedars of God, which are mentioned in the epic of Gilgamesh and the Psalms. For the first time in years, we were enveloped in green shade. A cuckoo called from somewhere high in the branches. The giant trees huddled close together, barely stirring. Once inside the grove, it was difficult to find a way out. The sky had disappeared. The notion that this landscape diminished human strife occurred to me more than once. Next day, we took a wrong turn and drove through a hilly stretch of backcountry filled with orchards so lush they obscured the gorge below. Plenty, I thought. Then I looked again. No one was tending these orchards. Early fallen fruit was rotting. On a muddy lane, we passed some women in ragged veils, leading thin, barefooted children. These orchards were abandoned. The landowners must have deemed them uneconomic. Perhaps they had forbidden their client farmers from harvesting the crop with some sort of penalty. At any rate, it was a scene of wasteful control. The family groups tiptoeing among the trees were Syrian refugees who would probably have been assaulted and driven away had they been found picking fruit. Even through months of deepening poverty, these were the realities of life in Lebanon that East Beirut did not admit. Theo mm -hmm. does have a quite extraordinary reading voice, so I do urge you to seek out ABR's podcast because he reads the essay in its entirety, and it's quite a thing to hear any writer read their own work, but it's a particular pleasure to read this essay. A question I am grappling with at the moment, but I'm in the middle of, having returned from Cairo and thinking about what that experience meant to me and what I saw and what I got, and the story I would like and am able to say about that. I'm really stuck on the question of how do you write a place that does not belong to you and to which you will never belong? We both had an equivalent experience as expats as diplomatic spouses, we had access to parts of the country and to parts of privilege that other people simply did not get. And yet we have the distance that writers have, that watchful distance that allows you to see things and tell a story of the place. How have you approached this fully ethical, emotional question? How do you write a word? It's uh, 
Next, next to displacing the explosion to the back, that was the other big question I face. And um, I, I did not, I had to improvise the solution. I improvised the solution in the writing. Um, there's no hard and fast rule for doing it. I'd be interested, I think, I want to ask you how you had to negotiate it yourself. But um, the way I negotiated it was um, really to avoid standing between, any, as I say, when I, wrote, when I wrote the essay, I didn't think it was going to, this was going to happen to it. I didn't realise that the readers knew quite this way. But I tried to imagine anyone sitting down to read it one day would not want me standing between them and the events I was trying to describe. Um, and so uh, I uh, avoided um, expressing my own emotional um, emotional wrangling with the subject to the to the greatest extent that I could. Um, I wanted simply to put things before the reader uh, that would add up to a larger situation, uh, rather than coming in over the top lecturing them or, or moralizing at them. And so uh, I, I, wanted, I wanted the whole to illustrate the part. I didn't want my part to illustrate the whole. When it comes down to when you were very kind about what you said about this working at the level of the sentence, at the level of the sentence, I tried to remove or avoid using the pronouns I and we as much as I possibly could, except for except for narrating basic things. We went here, we, we saw this, we did that. Um, I can't avoid if you're going to tell a, a real, give people a realistic idea of what happened. You have to be in the story. But I didn't want the story to be about me. Um, and so uh, just episode by episode, sentence by sentence, I, I carefully restrained myself while I, while I was doing it. There's a, a New Zealand uh, writer and critic um, who uh, I was lucky enough to hear about speak, he speak about uh, a concept he, he believed he came up with, St. Andrew Smith, and his phrase is, his concept of this is the inhumanity of the picturesque. And uh, that is to say, and he applied it, 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 he derived it from his analysis and commentary on um, some of the romantic poets, particularly Wordsworth, Coleridge walking in the countryside and imagining how wonderful it must be to be a hermit. Um, well, okay, maybe not to be a hermit, but if you ask the hermit, um, <laughs> the hermit may be there because of death. Yeah, solipsism, exactly. The hermit may be there because of death and poverty. Uh, but it's, it's sort of finding that out and recognizing about how marvelous it must be. And um, the inhuman, that is the inhumanity of I um, and it is a it is part of my ethical core as a writer now. I don't know if Andrew Smith's ever published or written about that concept in a, in a book or an article. He hasn't he should because it's it, it profoundly influenced me. I don't expect to speak about it. Um, and so, in writing about those Syrian refugees, for example, um, uh, I, I I simply wanted to describe describe precisely what I the way that I saw them. And uh, convey precisely the reason, the probable reason why they were there, and uh, the probable context in which they existed, and the probable reasons for their suffering. But you do not know. Uh, uh, well, uh, I do. I do myself. You do not sit inside their bodies. No. And that would be the extremely presumptuous. Um, I, I have no right to assume the point of view of a uh, Syrian refugee mother. Uh, trying to protect her children. I have a uh, right and I have a, a, a duty if I could possibly bring their difficulties to the, the attention of a larger audience who can hopefully do something to help them. That I'll do. But I'll, I'll never try and, or in empathizing with them, I, I as a person would hope that I can empathize and, and imagine what it must be like to live in that terrible problem to be driven out of the country and to be assaulted if you try and think for it to survive. But but this is an essay about Beirut, in which mm -hmm. you are a participant, but you are not the centre. Exactly. You're not the sum of this universe. No, it, you are in the orbit of this yes. city and its politics. And uh, you have, to, uh, I, I think, I, I had, the impressions, I thought I had to accept that fact. Basic fact, 
um, I'm just another tennis ball on the tennis court and from other players. I, I don't know if you've come to the same conclusion. Um, I would like it's a really difficult question to answer about Clara because the site of my engagement with it and the site of my conflict with it was my problem. And so the things that happened to me and happened to my body are the ways in which I use the country. And that is very difficult to separate out from yourself. That's a different thing. It is a different thing like that. And it's also hard to write about that without making a grand presumption about speaking about how Egypt treats women, which is something that I I don't want to be the, the woman who says this is the way that works. I can only, I feel like, pull it down to the level of this is what it felt like to walk the street in my own skin. And I think the way that I've come to think about it is to contextualise it and say that is also the site of how I am in Australia. And to use it not as a way of delineating some country border, but to think about how I write myself in the world. Mm -hmm. Which is not to say put myself in the middle of the experience, but to say that that is where the experience happened. Yeah, yeah. I was I was hurt, I was assaulted, I was harassed. Those things coloured the way I feel about being in the country, but those things are also a mirror for how the country impacted yeah. itself. So I'm still grappling with how to write that. What it's made me do is reflect on how I write myself in this country. And I think that's what being an expat can allow you to do is have an extraordinary distance from the place that made you. And the things that I saw through the lens of being in Egypt helped me understand this place better rather than that place better. Mm -hmm. um, I think I have an understanding of Egyptian politics, a functional understanding of Egyptian politics, and a functional understanding of what it's like to be a person in that country. But the thing I feel like I have to say is stuff about what it means to be here and what it means to be Australian. And that experience was the thing that was twisted yeah. in that place. It seems to me, what you said a moment ago about where the experience happened, that yeah. is everything. That's what really determines the validity of, of your perspective. Because the experience happened in the body and to the body, then that is the validity of the narrative position that you take. I can, I can see what you mean. The experience in Lebanon, apart from the explosion, didn't happen on or in or through or to my body. It happened outside me. So that determines the angle from which I talk myself. Yeah. Um, and it's all it's all about adopting the it's all about adopting the, the perspective that will show the story in the most appropriate light. Um, and so th th that's another question that, that um, came up with me when I was thinking about writing this essay, even before I sat down to write this, um, while I was keeping notes while I was sort of trying to shape whatever cloudy ideas I had. Um, people, Lebanon gets talked about a lot in, in the news, in, in, in the media, and in, in history books, and, uh, and in political analysis uh, as, a, as, a, as a polity, as a political system, or as a, or as a um, I mean, David Hurst's famous book, The Aware of Small States, as a site for great power competition. Yes. Um, and then, oh, rightly so, the same as any polity, it has a, has a unique history, it has an extremely complex political uh, context. Um, but that is not where the experience happens, I don't know. Yeah. Um, so I have been, I have read several histories of Lebanon, I can recommend a lot, I can recommend David Hurst, I can recommend uh, Robert Fisk. Um, and they're wonderful if you want to know the facts and you want to know, and you want to know the background to the terrible position that millions of people in Lebanon are now in. But what you're writing is that the, mm -hmm. the, the mechanisms of the yeah. street, the rhythms of yeah. street politics. Yes, it, it, a only a fraction of how it can feel to be in that country, to be in that place, while these things are going on. Almost it's machinery. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, well, all the, not only really quite the machinery, more like the biology. Uh, the, an, ecosystem. an ecosystem, yes, and an emotional ecosystem. Well, literature is a really important part of that, and that's what one of the questions I want to ask you is, what were you reading, who were you reading, because Australia does not have 
as much access to the incredibly rich, wonderful novels and the deep tradition of Arabic poetry. But there's wonderful contemporary writers who don't, we simply don't get them here. Who are you reading to immerse yourself? Yeah. Who would you recommend to the audience to start? Okay. Well, I was reading anything I could get my hands on. Um, I have not had this degree of freedom to read and explore and study and get to know a uh, new type of literature since early university, which was 15 years before I got to know that. Um, and so it was, it was total freedom. Uh, probably, I mean, the, the, the Lebanese author, if anyone's heard of the Lebanese author, it's bound to be Khatouj Zabrat, the author of The Prophet. Um, this is now going back nearly a century. Uh, but, and, and, and the Prophet, and Khatouj Zabrat, was, was a marvelous writer, I think, from all points of view. But he's not typical. Um, and uh, contemporary Lebanese literature uh, goes in many, many different directions. You mentioned poetry. Well, um, I mean, Arabic poetry comes out of a tradition that is profoundly different from the sort of the European tradition that we've inherited in Australia. It's, it's more, it's Arabic poetry even today is still more incantatory. It's it, it's uh, it's lines are longer. It's it's reach. It's it's breadth is more epic in scope. Um, the statements are bolder and more passionate. Um, and I think if anyone wanted to read a couple of um, poets of particularly the modern era world, but also particularly on Lebanon, on whom Lebanon has had a profound formative effect, they should start with um, a poet, a poet originally from Syria, whose pen name. Is Adams simply A D O N I S, um, whose selected poems exist in English translation by a Libyan American poet called Kamel Matawa. And um, Adams is, is regarded as the preeminent living Arab poet still. Uh, he, he, his work is uh, marvelous. And he was uh, really a founding figure of a modernist Arab poetry in Beirut you know, decades ago. The other uh, poet, I, I had read Adonis before, and I, I took, my, took his book with me. The poet I discovered had been meaning to read for a long time while living in Lebanon, Lebanon was a Palestinian poet, uh, Mahmoud Darwish, uh, who was almost, I guess, fated to have to write about uh, the Nakba, the, 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 the coming of the State of Israel and the displacement of the Palestinian people. And they were, those two poets were the doorway for me into. Um, into Lebanese poetry, uh, Arabic poetry more broadly. There's an anthology, uh, I read two anthologies about the Nakba, one of which is a sort of survey of writing about it in many genres, including Darwish and many others. And there was a smaller anthology in which Darwish, Adonis, and a couple of other poets called Victims of a Map. Um, that was a nice bit out. Um, the Lebanese poet I read who impressed me the most was a uh, is a woman called Venus Khori Gatta, who um, was born into, uh, I guess you would say, a, a well-to-do or aristocratic family, and has divided her time between Lebanon and France, and writes in French. Um, she had a very extraordinary style as a poet, because when she was growing up, it was one of the, it was her brother who was shaping up as a oh, young man. Oh, so she takes up the family. Yes, yeah. She, her brother was sort of shaping up to be the poet as a young man, but he tragically died. And so then she then took up the mantle. She decided she would become a poet. And the first poem in her first book, uh, the Lord said the words were wolves, the first book that I read. Uh, this, the first poem is this kind of staking of claim. Um, that I will be a poet. And it has this wonderful line. She, her ambition was d'être le seul maître du jeu, to be the sole master of the game. And I thought, challenge accepted. That's <laughs> fantastic. I thought that was wonderful. That doesn't, yeah. that doesn't explain the ambition of the writers. <laughs> I don't know what No, no, it, it was, that was right. Um, For me, it was novels. Yeah, and then it got on, it got on to novels. I got on to novels. Okay. Did you? Uh, no, you tell us novels. Oh, ah, well, the, um, this is my favourite subject. <laughs> who to read? Yeah, well, who to read? Um, there are there was three novels to read. My uh, impression on me. Two are 
pretty well known. Uh, and even in, even outside the know, one is um, Elias Khoury, who lives in uh, New York and is a distinguished journalist. He's written a great deal about about the Palestinian displacement and about the Lebanese civil war. His books uh, they hit very hard, but they do hit home. The one I the one I read first was called The Journey of Little Gandhi, which is about a shoe shine. Um, in Beirut during the Civil War, and it's a it's a harrowing story. It tells well, it tells the story of the moment of his death from multi, the points of view of multiple characters, um, and yeah, as I say, it's very hard, but it's, it it is a, a very true portrait of what happened to people um, ordinary people in the street during the Civil War. Um, the uh, the other major uh, novelist uh, from Lebanon. Uh, uh, is Armand Malouf, who lives in France, writes in French, but has been translated. And he writes really beautiful, um, meditative historical novels, reaching all across the Arab world and North Africa and ancient Persia and um, cities like Samarkand, and stories of the Silk Road. Um, they're quite bewitching. Uh, if people want to read one of his novels, I recommend Ports of Pool, which is in English. Um, and it's a, it's a love story. Uh, which is intertwined with the the shaky foundation of the modern state of Lebanon and the, the, the catastrophic scission that produced Israel and Palestine. And it's a love, it's a love story across those two years. It's yeah, it's almost like the I mean, the title in French is Les Echelles Les du Levant, the rungs or the stairs of the Levant. And that's a, an old saying which. Um, it's a metaphor for the cities, the port cities that go right down the Levant from Tripoli down through Batroun and Biblos and Beirut and Tyre to Haifa and to Gaza. And it's the notion they should all be one stairway, really. Um, but they've been torn apart, as these lovers have been. The novelist who had the most important effect on me as a writer um, and in how I think about Lebanon, it wasn't either of those two, it's another one. Another writer called Sharif Majdalani, who writes in French and Arabic. Some of his work has been translated, but unfortunately not yet the one that shaped my thinking, which is called Le, Le, Dernier, uh, Le, pardon, Le Dernier Seigneur de Marseille, The Last Lord of Marseille, which is about um, this, this concept in Lebanon and also other parts of the Arab world of the Abadai, which it roughly translates as big man, strong man, mm -hmm. local tough guy, local authority figure. And the book um, showed me, really showed me vividly how power works in Lebanese society, how it translates right down from party politics and military politics and all these parties and cadres, right down to the local big guy, the local guy, guy and petty crime, and little business empires and little fiefdoms, neighborhood disputes, um, it all, this one man uh, wants to be the tough guy of his generation, his neighborhood, and that's all he cares about. Anyone else can go to the devil. They'll have people shot, they'll have their land poisoned. Um, and he doesn't realize that his way of life is what has poisoned the rest of the society. And um, the book ends, spoiler alert with the bombs falling in the Civil War, shelling from street to street, and all he can do is sit in his little palace and he won't save himself. That's, a, that's all he has. Not available yet in translation. Not available yet in translation. Please contact your bookseller. Yes, yes. <laughs> yes. But the other thing that the other thing that got me about that book was um, how it was written. Because it was written in French, and uh, the, the stylistically it wasn't experimental. Uh, I mean, it's just simple, clear, limpid sentences telling a straightforward narrative, gripping narrative. What made it really gripping for me is the fact that the paragraphs don't break. Each chapter is just one paragraph. And so the tension doesn't the break. Oppression. The oppression and the claustrophobia build and build and build. And, yeah. And uh, it's extraordinarily effective. So um, I could, I mean, I don't do that in this essay, but um, I could not have written what I wrote or thought what I think about Lebanon without showing this much I have a similar novel 
experiencing at the first night we were in Cairo, we went walking, looking for a bookshop, which is how I orient myself in the world. And I found my local bookshop, D1. And I said, what should I read? And the bookseller gave me a book published in the, I think in the early 60s um, by Wonky Dali, who wrote only one novel and then tragically killed himself in London. And it's a, a vaguely autobiographical novel about a young man from a very rich family, but his half of the family had run out of money. And they are determined to make sure that he will keep up the appearance of wealth, which means that he's not allowed to have a job, he's not allowed to pass out on his own, he's not allowed to fail. So he's never allowed to fail, he's never allowed to not wear the best clothes, not wear the best clothes, but he's constantly under the thumb of the family members of money. And the revolution is happening, and Egypt may belong to itself again. And he doesn't know whether or not that's the place he wants to belong to, or whether or not he lusts for and loves the culture he's taught to believe is superior, which is Britain, and yet he loathes her at the same time. And so you have this man stuck between the wealth that he doesn't have and the poverty he's not allowed, the revolution that he thinks he should, he should want, and the place that he in fact loves and wants and hates himself for wanting. And it's a person stuck in perpetual limbo. And to read that, published in the 1960s, and then to arrive years into the decline of the optimism of the Arab Spring in Egypt, when it was clear that that promise, that optimistic heft, had disappeared and been replaced with a kind of nihilistic humiliation of despair, felt like being handed a key to a country I had just entered. So those books are just as yeah, yeah. It's a similar story in a way to Lebanon in some respects, but it's a much, much smaller country. And um, perhaps, uh, I mean, it has a, politically, it was, it was a strange creation. Uh, all, all of that part of the Middle East was from Iraq and Syria, Lebanon, it was, and, and Palestine. It was all the lies of the map. Would you invent it? Would people invent it today if they didn't have it? Very probably not. So that's why I love and why I want to speak the reading of the place. Yes. Because novels and poetry tell us something about a place. Yes. As your essay does, that we don't get if we watch the news and we don't get if we read the history. It's the visceral, street level, emotional heft of literature. Um, what it's like to be a person in that place. Yes. Were there, were, what other authors of books were? Nawal al Sadali. Uh, this incredible Egyptian fellow, she died last year, a professional agitator, a professional piece of grit in the oyster of the Egyptian polity. And she was a magnificent person, wrote incredibly visceral, difficult novels about women insisting upon themselves in a place that would violently oppose them, but was imprisoned in the 1980s for more than a year, without charge, without trial, without end, and wrote a prison memoir with a borrowed eyebrow pencil on a roll of toilet paper. And she is extraordinary. Look out for both the prison memoir and the novel she wrote called Women at Point Zero. Um, we should go to questions. Yes? I'm sure there are questions for yours. I have two final questions with Thea, but I'm holding them in my back pocket. Does anyone have questions with Thea? Before we do, I really would like to harp on about this because it's important. This is an account of trauma, but this is a literary achievement. And I'd love it if you would keep our questions tonight to honour that literary achievement as opposed to taking Thea back into those moments of trauma. If I'm sure everyone can agree that that's important to do. Um, do we have any questions from the audience? I'm not easily no, able to see you because yeah. I'm blinded by the mind. No, after that. Um, Thea, could you just read us the, the essay? Tell us how you found your way in here. Because that's where I just want to be right at the start. Where do I begin? How do I get that story out of the way? Could you just read us the other paragraphs? Okay. Thanks, Mark. Yes, uh, they're fairly short paragraphs, so I can. Um, uh, as the March of e April evenings grew hotter, the streets of East Beirut were as empty as our cars. The grumble of traffic had disappeared. Without the usual smoke screen, the nearby mountains and coastline were visible for weeks. Parks are scarce in Beirut, and gardens are private. But this spring, 
Vines and Bougainvillea were clambering over the high walls, and no one was trimming them. It was possible to take solitary walks and hear birdsong. The only reminder of the city's previous energy were the leaves shifting in a sea breeze from the port, which East Bay Route surrounds like raked seating in a theatre. All that moved in the lanes of Ashrafie, Genese, Mar Michael, and Mono was sunlight and shadows. For the first time, every neighborhood knew what it felt like to be left alone. That was how the ruin began. Well, uh, it was, it's kind of insane. How, how did I, yeah, how, how did I breach the blank page? Um, <coughs> it's going back a while now, but actually I started, um, I started writing the essay at the end. I wrote the explosion first to get rid of it. Um, I came back to it uh, as I was putting the final version together, the final cut, if you like, and just adjusted this and wrote that and shifted things. But uh, the first thing I wrote was the explosion, precisely because it was so vivid. Um, and I, I thought this is an important thing in a way because uh, a lot of our friends who were also hit in the explosion, whose houses were also destroyed, unfortunately survived. Um, some of them can't remember what happened, uh, as is understandable because they were, they were hit on the head or it was, it was so terrible they backed it out. I thought, well, I can remember it, so it was horrible, but get it down, get it down, because if anything, just you'll preserve a record for somebody in a hundred years. I don't know. And so then, you haven't it. I haven't reread it. The only time I reread that part of the essay was to record it for the OVR podcast, which I did without a person. Uh, because I just wanted to get through it once and be done with it. So having written the, uh, written the explosion, I pushed it, as I said, to the back. I thought, right, I want that to the end. And let's, now having cleared the air, where does the story begin that leads to that explosion? And I thought, right, well, that sentence, that was how the ruin began. I thought, I wrote that down in my notebook. I thought, right, well, if I can answer that question, I can start to write this thing. So where did it begin? Well, there was the revolution, but that was sort of a bit different. That needs to be explained somewhere else. Where all this strangeness and madness really started was in lockdown and with those silences. So starting with this terrible noise of the explosion, I thought, well, we start in silence. That's where we really began. And so I just thought back to that time and I thought, of myself and my wife and our friend are sitting in our living room or overlooking the garden area or looking out to sea. Um, and we were doing nothing. <laughs> there was nothing we could do. And I thought, well, the city was empty, so were our diaries, so were our calendars. Ah, there's a, there's a metaphor to start with, or simile to start with. Um, and so that was my way into describing the silence and the absence I also just wanted to give people the feeling of where we had been living. It's a very lovely area, the you know, East Beirut. It's uh, preserved more of the old buildings of Beirut than the concrete jungle parts of the city. It's very difficult um, to, to describe quite how this piece of writing came to be other than that. Um, it, 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 started to, it started to flow, I suppose. Um, it started to... I, I thought, well, it's coming back to me in waves of memory, and if I can convey to the reader that sensation as it's happening to me, we might get someone. But there might have also been keeping notes. <laughs> another, another question? Yes. yes. At that point, I'm um, I'm yes. quite interested in if there were any things you decided to leave out, any parts of the oh, um, diary that you thought this isn't going to get well. Or... Yes, yes. Um, for anyone streaming at home who might not have heard the question, it's a wonderful question, and the question is, uh, were there any uh, aspects of the story that had to be left out and had to move out? And the answer is yes, thousands. <laughs> <laughs> All but, I mean, this, this barely captures a fraction of the experiences that we had in the one that I had personally, or the thoughts that I had. And, um, I, I, oh my gosh, I mean, 
there's a whole other story about visiting Egypt, for example, visiting uh, BJ and her husband Sam in Egypt. That's a potted story. Um, there's, there's more to say about the Lebanese revolution, um, because in the early days, before it really exploded, there were protest marches and smaller demonstrations. Um, and a friend who was visiting us at the time from overseas had been, she'd been an aid worker in Cambodia and had come to us for a break and then came for revolution. Um, she and I got caught in a bar um, when a party of, of young revolutionaries marched past all of a sudden before it all really got going. And we thought, oh my gosh, what's this? <laughs> They're all painted in flags, but they, they marched into the bar and sang revolutionary songs in the bar while having drinks and then marched on. <laughs> yes, <laughs> you see, um, that, there are lots of things that just have to be written. There are other parts of Lebanon we visited that aren't in here. There's the whole question of uh, animosity with Israel, um, which is a very difficult subject. Um, and so this is not the last essay I'm going to write about this. Um, I'm quite sure of that. Uh, I had wondered whether I would, because there are breaks in this essay where you know, there's a gap and you take a breath and then you go to the next section. I had thought of maybe widening those gaps and filling them in. I'm not going to do that, I've decided. I'm going to leave this as it is and write companion pieces, at least two or three. They have to be. Any other questions? Just how do you feel about the legacy of the Holocaust in Lebanon now? Would you be interested in going back as soon as COVID allows? Um, so the question is, how does Thea feel about Lebanon now? I feel, uh, I feel many complex emotions. That's a very wonderful question, John. I feel very complex emotions about Lebanon. I, it's a country I, my wife and I both grown to love. We grew, uh, we, we, we grew to be deeply attached to it. There were many people we met there who are still there and we're very deeply attached. And uh, as if you, uh, I mean, the other thing about Lebanon is that, um, just when you think the political and economic situation can't get any worse, it does. And it's gone down, it's in this death spiral, politically and economically. It is utterly, utterly tragic. And yet, on the other side, on the other hand, the people you meet in everyday life are just wonderful. They're warm, um, generous, friendly, chatty, interested, curious, um, and uh, hospitable in the best traditions of. Well, there's this thing known as our hospitality, uh, and it, it, it's all about welcoming the stranger um, and giving the stranger food and, and drink. That that tradition is is in the DNA, of it, and it's impossible not to love it. So, what do I feel about Lebanon? Would I would I like to go back there? Well, um, yes, but um, I think it would be almost soul destroying. Um, now, to see what's happened in this new country. But the thing is, I'm very privileged to be able to say that because I'm not sitting in Lebanon, I'm sitting in a comfortable chair in Canberra. And um, there are about 8 million people in Lebanon uh, who are living through a tough of circumstances. And they are not, their souls have not been destroyed. Um, and they are not letting themselves be destroyed. They're incredibly resilient. Define people. I would like to go back to Lebanon and see. It, I would very much like to go back to Lebanon and see what people are making of it for themselves. Um, unfortunately, the political crisis is such that who nobody can possibly say what the results can be. One thing I say in the essay is that it is a mafia state. Uh, the political class is made up of. Uh, parties and often family groups and clans who basically own the system. And they're all rivals. They all belong to a different religion, a different sect. They all hate each other like mar rival mafias. Um, but they've decided that running a state as a cabal together is more profitable than shooting each other. Um, and so that is, that is a terrible way to run a country, basically by strangling. Um, and I well, it, as Bijo said, it's a country that I will never belong to. And uh, I don't know if I could go back to 
really. I, I, I don't, it's certainly not my fault. Um, what I can do is try and bring these problems to a wider audience. Well, the sex and sex is a kind of problem. Well, yes, there's, there's a lot to, well, I'm glad you say that, BJ, because I certainly wrote it with love, a lot of it, um, because the Lebanese people deserve far better than that. And, um, and then if I could go back and face it just now. But as I say, the more people are facing it, the more courage I have. Do we have any more questions? Yes. Hi, Theo. Following on from that answer, when you were writing your essay, what messages or emotions or feelings were you hoping the reader would take? What was the most important message you were trying to say? Oh, that's a wonderful question. Thank you. Um, for anyone at home, uh, the question was while I was writing the essay, um, uh, what emotions or feelings or messages was I hoping to convey? Well, uh, <laughs> First and foremost, Lebanon is a beautiful place and um, with magnificent things in it that um, anyone interested in history uh, or anyone interested in exploring a, a beautiful, vibrant culture should expose themselves to because it's, it's one of us. <laughs> uh, and um, that it is, it, 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 um, it, deserves, it, it deserves a bit of a good name. Um, also, its problems deserve to be a better known because they're, they're unique. Um, and solving them could almost be a model for how to uh, rebuild a society, build a, build a healthier society. Um, it's this kind of microcosm for all that is best and worst in how a society can function. My project as a reader. I think one of the things that's extraordinary about your essay is that it's written with distance and and written with respect about that distance that you know you're never going to belong to us. But the coda of the essay says that I am not a new. We can't we can't be new. And I think if there's anything to take away from the essay, it's that that our our sense of distance, particularly from this country, which has both the geographical luck and the geographical tyranny of distance, is that we aren't immune to the things that happen, we aren't able to extract ourselves from it. No. That they will find us. Yeah, those things will find us. Uh, the explosion found us um, in our homes. Um, that to me was the explosion, funnily enough, was kind of an illuminating experience because um, generations of Lebanese for decades have been killed by bombs and gunfire. And being hit by the explosion was being hit by, like being hit by a, by a gigantic bomb. And um, I had never conceived of what it would be like to be blown up, um, but it's happened to me. My wife, it's happened to our friends. Now we know what it's like. And um, suddenly it is possible to identify with all those victims who were not lucky enough to survive their own explosions. Um, and suddenly, um, Lebanon, I mean, the, the cause of the explosion was not a bomb. It was, it was criminal neglect. Uh, for anyone who doesn't know what happens, more than 3,000 tons of fertilizer, ammonium nitrate, were stored in completely unsafe conditions along, and it's highly flammable when superheated. They were stored in completely unsafe conditions alongside cooking oil and fireworks. What do you think was going to happen? <laughs> and it was approaching, it had been approaching 40 degrees by <coughs> like August day, high summer, um, in a totally unventilated warehouse. And someone had been trying to weld a steel plate onto the that warehouse earlier that day and spark the fireworks. And so it was total criminal neglect that led to an absolute, absolute catastrophe, the largest um, non-nuclear peacetime explosion in history. Now that's a freak event, but it's also not a freak event because of all those conditions, that was a that that port notionally belongs to the Lebanese state, and it was completely mismanaged. And that's absolutely typical, sadly, of, of what a lot of a lot of what happens in the Lebanese state that's probably. And so it was a freak event, but it was also quite typical 
and it burst in through our windows and doors and found us all at home. And um, Lebanese and non-Lebanese alike. Suddenly we were all one in the side of in the, in the side of catastrophe. The strange thing happened. Yes. Well, the strange thing happened uh, among many strange things. I, I was talking to my doctor who was living in um, in, in Beirut. I was Skyping with him a week or so after the accident, and he he was he's a lovely man, and he was passionate when he said this. He, he said and he thought everyone, every foreigner, every expat who is affected by the Lebanese explosion should be made an honorary citizen of Lebanon. <laughs> 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 I don't know quite what to say. He wasn't. It's it, it was strange to say he wasn't joking. Yeah, he was in you know, And I found that tremendously moving. Um, you have to wrap up. Yes. And I have one last poster question to you. Yeah. You completed a poetry book you. while you were in Lebanon in that same notebook that you took the notes to this extraordinary essay. Which you gave to <laughs> <laughs> Which, which you, which was saved from the explosion, was yes. caught in a pot fire. It was. It was blown off my desk, out the window, into the window box, when everything else that blew off my desk blew six stories down. So in this miraculous, beautiful notebook, given the club, filled with watchful, careful, beautiful observation, you had completed the poetry book. Would you please, to bring us out, read us? Yes, I will. I'll read you the last part of the book. The book is called um, Beginning in Sight, uh, which is a phrase that comes from one of the other poems. And the idea is that we've all been in lockdown, we've all been in these enclosed situations. Um, people will always say, when is the, the end is not in sight? When will the end be in sight? Well, I thought it was more like, when is the beginning in sight? Because this is the end of an era. We're going to enter a strange new world after. So the beginning is just out of reach, just over there. Um, it goes through some rather dark places, but it ends on a hopeful note. The second half of the book, I hope, is, tends to move the light. So I'll read you the last one. And um, it's called Hereafter. Sunrise hesitated. Where glass panes faced east, they caught a gilt stare that outlived an instant. Made birds break off their chat on new sprigs and look. Slow breeze that chafed bark, creaking as the cane chairs in which we sat, and where sunrise found us up watching for it. Errors uncorrected. The first so far on the meticulous scroll this day was inscribing over the rough ground of the last. With first light hanging, our cups steamed. We may have known then what it is to be ghosts. But that is nothing. The sheer dead stop, the red face of the sun. That was our delight. To have dazed the morning, vexed it, forced it to hold its nerve. Would you join me in thanking this extraordinary gentleman, Theora? impressed upon me that I am to impress upon you with abandon, reckless abandon. Please buy a copy of this wonderful issue of this wonderful magazine. It is an extraordinary issue with lots of other magnificent writers, but this is my favourite issue of the year, and that is saying something. The Caliber Prize is an extraordinary prize, and it goes to an extraordinary writer. So please zip the QR code, get yourself a copy, all from your local bookstore, and... Thank you again for coming out on such a cold and chilly night for hearing this extraordinary story. Thank you to AMU, thank you to Australian Book Review, and thank you to my, my wonderful friend. Thank you, my yeah. wonderful friend and opposite number in <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, everyone. <laughs>